Then there was Gillian Bear. <laughs> then there was Gillian Bear. Rapid, flexible, extreme, serene. Oh, fantastic. That's right. The fluidity of Wolf. The legacies of Wolf for a writer, where to start? The legacies of Wolf for a writer who happens to be a woman, there's no end. Of course, Wolf writes about endings a lot, never more teasingly, ironically, than in the bouleversing, never ending Orlando where all ends in death. Orlando would say, sitting upright, his face clouded with gloom, for that was the way his mind worked now, and violent seesaws from life to death, stopping at nothing in between, so that the biographer must not stop either, must, but, but must fly as fast as he can, and so keep pace with the unthinking, passionate, foolish actions and sudden extravagant words in which it is impossible to deny. Orlando, at this time of his life, indulged. All ends in death, Orlando would say, sitting upright on the ice. But Sasha, who after all had no English blood in her, but was from Russia, where the sunsets are longer, the dawns less sudden, and sentences often left unfinished from doubt as to how best to end them. Sasha stared at him, perhaps sneered at him, for he must have seemed a child to her and said nothing. But at length the ice grew cold beneath them, which she disliked, so pulling him to his feet again, she talked so enchantingly, so wittily, so wisely, but unfortunately always in French, which notoriously loses its flavour in translation, that he forgot the frozen waters, or night coming, or the old woman, or whatever it was, and would try to tell her, plunging and smashing, splashing among a thousand images which had gone as stale as the women who inspired them, what she was like. Snow, cream, marble, cherries, alabaster, golden wire, none of these. She was like a fox or an olive tree, like the waves of the sea when you look down upon them from a height, like an emerald, like the sun on a green hill which is yet clouded, like nothing he had seen or known in England. Ransack the language as he might, words failed him. He wanted another landscape and another time. No matter where in Wolfe's own chronology of work you choose to look, her writing always offers a thaw to the frozen, always works at the staleness in language or tradition or experience until both landscape and tongue are open to a kind of freshness, until landscape and tongue become a fresh composite in themselves. I mean, take the legacy of the wide open yet still held and steady shape of the novel. Miraculous understanding because Wolf, because of Wolf, because Wolf existed, the novel can take any shape it likes. I like to think she was one of the first writers truly to understand the fruitful <laughs> meld of differing aesthetic forms to make new form, the meld of the short form, the long form, poetry, music, performative forms seemingly more situ kind of suited to the voice, and to understand tradition so well as to be able to skate its necessary surface and go in as deep beneath or as high above as she liked. There's this legacy too of the insider and the outsider status, both held at once, understood simultaneously. Now, no novelist can breathe without this apparatus, and Wolf is a genius of both states and of a fluency and fluidity between them. And there's the legacy too of exactly this fluent, fluid wit and versatility, a crucial imaginative unfixing of categories in pretty much everything she did. I'll just quote her again. Perhaps a mind that is purely masculine cannot create any more than a mind that is purely feminine. It is fatal to be a man or woman pure and simple. One must be woman-manly or man-womanly. There's the vital antidote to fatality, not just in this, but in the sheer force and energy and joy of language and intellect and everything she wrote. That's not just legacy, that's a kind of lifeblood, that's life force, that's way beyond all ends in death. And there's a legacy too of her clear, disciplined openness. And when it comes to writing and reading anything, the permissive common sense of the quote I'm just about to finish with from the common reader, here it is. Without this, I'm nothing, no writer is anything. And if you go with this legacy of disciplined openness, you tend to be awful glad as a writer about what Wolf made and makes all the time possible. Any method is right. Every method is right that expresses what we wish to express if we are writers, that brings us closer to the novelist's intention if we are readers. <laughs>
and another distinguished scholar we were delighted to welcome onto our editorial board. Rachel's publications include books on shopping, women, Freud and consumer culture, and two seminal collections of essays on Virginia Woolf. Rachel is herself an experienced Woolf editor, having edited two collections of Woolf's essays, The Crowded Dance of Modern Life and A Woman's Essays, as well as her novel, Orlando, from which we've just heard uh, an extract. Rachel's work has been translated into a number of languages, including Italian and Japanese, and she has been visiting professor at Cornell, Rutgers, Otago in New Zealand, and the New Sorbonne in Paris. It gives me great pleasure to invite Rachel to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Well, Ray gave today's event, as, as you know, the title Wolf in the 21st Century, and I now know, I'm, as I was quite sure, I'm not the only person here to have thought of that passage at the end of A Room of One's Own, which picks up a second time on the hypothetical figure of Shakespeare's sister. So I'm going to quote, as Gillian has, and like Ali did too, from, from Wolf, um, a long paragraph here. She lies buried, Shakespeare's sister this is, she lies buried where the omnibuses now stop, opposite the elephant and castle. Now my belief is that this poet, who never wrote a word and was buried at the crossroads, still lives. She lives in you and in me and in many other women who are not here tonight, for they are washing up the dishes and putting the children to bed. But she lives, for great poets do not die, they are continuing presences, they need only the opportunity to walk among us in the flesh. This opportunity, as I think, it is now coming within your power to give her. For my belief is that if we live another century or so, I'm talking of the common life, which is the real life, and not of the little separate lives which we live as individuals. And have 500 a year and rooms of our own, then the opportunity will come and a dead poet who was Shakespeare's sister will put on the body which she has so often laid down. Well, we've lived another century, more or less, and so has Virginia Woolf, who did write a word, these words, and many war words, and whose individual life has become a common life, shared across thousands and millions of books and screens and classrooms and kitchens. Woolf has herself become Shakespeare's sister, as she imagined her coming into her own and into everyone's own in the 21st century. She's queen of women writers across all centuries and without any sign of a possible successor. Her presence and visibility enable and inspire the writing and thinking of others. Where once she might have been sidelined or subordinated to some of the modernist men who were her contemporaries, today she's up, up there alongside and often above them. In many contexts, her writing has come to occupy the place that Eric Auerbach prof prophetically gave her more than half a century ago in Mimesis as the culmination of the tradition of European literature that begins with Homer. And is she on Facebook? Yes, of course. You can go to a page and personally connect with Adeline Virginia Stephen. Nowhere is the continuing presence of Wolfe more tangibly evident than in the many editions of her work that have appeared since she first came out of copyright in 1992. These editions have moved in broad terms from the general to the scholarly and from the, from the light paperback to the more solid volumes of the kind that will make up the Cambridge list. Far from being kept off the Oxbridge turf, as she was in a room of one's own, of course, Wolfe is now a fixture in the library her footnotability, a continuing and never-ending work, for there'll always be new footnotes needed, others outdated as times and questions change. What would Virginia Woolf have made of this new Woolf, these many new Woolfs that she's become? That's an unanswerable question, of course, if only because a Woolf born in 1982, a century after Virginia Stephen, would or will have been seeing the world of books and universities and courses 
in a completely different way from the one who was born in 1882. But I want to go back for a moment to that decade, a century after Wolfe's birth, a somewhat earlier phase than our own in the growth of Wolfe's studies, Wolfe's seminars and Wolfe notes. Back then in the mid-1980s, another country from now in economic terms, several British academic publishers were starting a series of short monographs about individual authors. The idea, and some of you may even be able to access a distant memory of this, was to produce new readings in light of the new kinds of theory and criticism that were quickly gaining currency as teaching tools, with feminist criticism prominent among them. One day, I got a letter asking if I'd like to write a book on Virginia Woolf for one of these series. I was taken aback. In fact, I was scared. It seems an extraordinary thing to admit now, but I hadn't read any of Woolf's novels, ever. Some years before, I'd come across A Room of One's Own by chance in a library and read it then and there one Saturday morning, a handsome old hardback, hardly ever taken out. For all I know, it may have been a first edition. I loved it, but it didn't occur to me, why didn't it, to then go and seek out the novels. When subsequently I was studying for an English degree, there was no Wolf on the course. I obviously didn't go to the right university. <laughs> If I had got around to reading her, and this was still true when I finally did, the likely medium for doing that would have been those unappealing little black books with cheap paper and no margin for making notes. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're handbag size, though. Those were the only Wolf paperbacks in print in the 80s, before she came out of copyright. So when I got the letter about the book, I felt, and I was, completely unqualified and my instinct was to retreat. At the time, I'd been writing something on Dorian Gray, and maybe it seemed that one W might sound like m much like another. At any rate, I wrote back to the series editor and said, could I do Wild instead? <laughs> there was a pause in those far-off days, remember? Communications of this kind passed on paper, and via the post, there was no rush. Eventually, the response came back, 